Um, so what we need to do with, with any paper for joining, yes, anybody could stick a bit of glue and, and stick these together. And yes, it, it might be okay, but um, there's a good chance that it may um, misbehave in the future if it was going on exhibition um, or pockets of, of adhesive is not in contact um, or there's more adhesive in some areas than, than not. So this is a technique that you can use for, for a lot of um, um, re you know, reasons really. Um, and that's applying the adhesive um, in an even application and also preparing the paper before in order to receive the adhesive, okay? So first of all, we need to, um, as we're limiting the amount of expansion, is to spray relax this, okay? Now we're using some um, fancy sprays. These are Dahlia sprays uh, imported from Japan, but you can use plastic sprays, it's fine. As long as it's got a, a fine nozzle and you don't get heavy droplets forming, and you'll see that's quite fine. And when you're using these, you have to pump them up um, and screw them down. When, at the end of the day, if you can release the pressure of these because they, they do uh, wear out um, the washers. Now, um, in order to um, handle the paper through the process, um, it's important to support it with the material. If you've got a very heavyweight paper, then you could probably get away with um, just, you know, um, applying the adhesive or, or relaxing it on the table. But if you're working on a very large sheet of paper on your own, or it's very thin and um, flexible, this is a method that you can use with safety, so you're not you don't get to a point and then stick your fist through the paper and have to start again. So it's a safe way that, and a transferable technique that you can use for, for any um, relaxation of papers. Um, this material is called Melanex, um, but it's, you know, you can use polythene if you want to. It's something that's relatively, um, you know, rigid, it's got to have some flexibility, but something that um, the paper, when it's slightly damp, will, will stick to it and also support it. It also provides uh, a membrane on the top for when you're smoothing down um, the top of the paper with, with the brush. Um, and again, if you've got a very fine, soft paper, if you did it directly onto the paper, you could raise the nap or if you're working with um, a drawing or some other media already there you could disrupt that so this minimizes disruption to the surface and any media disruption um, so they're, they're cut slightly larger than the paper because remember paper expands so we don't want to be too mean um, and uh, uh, allow for that now um, it's a good idea and then previous lectures, we've, we spoke about the right and the wrong side, or the rough and the smooth side, uh, to identify which is the rough side to begin with, because it's best when you're laminating something to put the rough, two rough sides together. So that means that you'll use less tenacious adhesive, so it'll be more flexible, um, the uh, laminate in the end, and also less adhesive means more long-term stability. Okay. So try and identify, and you can feel this, this paper that most definitely the right and the wrong side, can't you? That feels rough on the Yes, side. yeah. So That's you would nice. just identify that. <clears throat> so don't forget to do that. What I tend to do is put a little R, capital R, in the corner. So, so I know what. Studio. It, we were told, don't look at the paper, because your tendency is to look to, 
Mm. You don't look at the paper, just feel it, and then you know immediately. Yeah. But if you start looking and feeling, then yes. it's... Yeah, your brain takes over yeah. there, doesn't it? Yeah. Visual thing. Yeah. Good, good idea. Okay, so I'm going to take the first sheet of paper, try and move, because you're spraying, um, your extra material out of the way, because um, it can trouble. Okay? Now what I tend to do, because um, you'll need to relax it or spray it a couple of times either side, so it's best to start with the rough side um, uppermost, because you want to... Um, Eventually, because I'll be turning it over at least once, have it uppermost for pasting. Okay, usually two sprays is enough for uh, most people. As long as you keep an an idea where where the rough side is, you get a better map bond. Okay, so we're going to um, introduce moisture. So you would do this ahead of time. Um, you could even humidify it, put it in. Um, a damp marination, you know how you prepare prints with, between d damp blotting paper, you could do that. But if you have an um, already existing drawing or some other media that then you want to add to, then you have to be careful, um, you know, introducing moisture at this kind of level. Okay, so quite high up, so you get a, a nice even application. Now, paper takes on water in different ways through capillarity and diffusion and is made up, you know, the individual fibres are made up, very complex little things they are, but they're made up of um, crystalline and amorphous areas. Now, the crystalline resists the interaction with water and the absorption of water. So they take a lot longer, but that part of the fibre um, will take a lot longer to absorb the water. So, you know, spraying it just once and then thinking, oh, that's fine. It will only be the amorphous regions of the paper, so you'll get an uneven distribution of moisture. That's why you have to take your time a little bit. It all helps with the, the end result. So I've sprayed this, and now I'm, I'm avoiding puddling the surface, because you don't want um, beading on the surface if you can avoid it. Some papers that are highly sized will have a tendency to do that, but try and avoid it if you can. Then for control, because this is cut the same size, if you just hold this up and corner to corner, just register it. It's, it's like you would do in printmaking techniques. For those who have done printmaking. It's not very well cut. And then use your brush and in a kind of Union Jack, just push the air and the moisture further. So you're holding the brush like that for control. This is a Japanese technique. Use it in scroll mounting. Okay, then you can use very safely the Melon X to lift this up and turn it over. I always smooth it down so it's in contact with the bed. <clears throat> and then carefully, now this is quite a robust paper, so you won't have any problems in, in removing the melanose. You can just take it off like that. But if you have a very thin Japanese paper that you're working with, you need to remove the melanex very carefully. So the best way is to roll it like a sausage and a rolling pin across the surface and watch the edges here, because sometimes you can catch it and it will tear the paper if you're just focusing on one spot. So you're pushing the excess air and moisture away. Now take it right off the bed, because it can jump back and, and tear your object. And just repeat. spray again. It seems all a bit faffy, but actually, you know, if you were, uh, I mean, I did fine, all right. I know uh, the, the times that I just stuck things on boards and, and then came back the next day and was detaching because, you know, I just didn't get it right. So, 
Some, some of these, even though they're nearly £100 each, you wouldn't believe it, would you? They uh, have a tendency to drip sometimes. Okay, so that's pretty well relaxed. If you feel that, I'll turn it over. So if you feel that, it's not overly wet, but just nicely relaxed. And that will take on the adhesive. <laughs> Sorry? It doesn't feel wet at all. Mm -hmm. and it, it's in plain. It's important to have the two papers in plain and relaxed, mm -hmm. and then you'll get a better coating and um, adhesion. Oh, um, well, we would laminate um, for all sorts of reasons, really, to attach things onto secondary supports, um, to replace uh, backings that have been, you know, traditional backings that have deteriorated, and we would replace them with a laminate of this type, particularly to support modern art, artworks, because they are notoriously difficult. If you're working with a lot of machine-made papers and cylinder-made papers, they have very much a strong directional grain. So they interact with moisture in the atmosphere very aggressively. So this kind of can control the plane distortion by having something more rigid. And particularly if you cross-grain it, that evens out the tensions. Okay. Um, so lots of things, yeah. lots of things. Yeah. We would even use it um, to support like Indian miniatures because yeah. they're, they're wassily boards and yeah. lamination. Um, to make boxes, you know, all sorts of things, folders, as well as supporting artwork. Sometimes we have to laminate smaller sheets of paper so we can cut out um, infills, you know, to, to fill in losses in, in different artwork, so. Um, so keep this um, out of the way, and then we'll need to do the second sheet. I'll try and speed that up. Okay, so my... Uh, Um, be careful if you've got um, coloured paper or you've put some colouring on, on the paper if you want to do different, you know, some drawing and then laminate on the top or whatever it is or, or behind. Um, if there's any coloration or pigment or discoloration, if you're not careful, you can, um, with the spray, you can get puddling on a surface like this. So you might want to just put, to, to avoid that, we tend to put an edge of blotting paper, so we're spraying the, the central paper, but avoiding puddling the melanics. <clears throat> I'm sure these sort of techniques are not just preparatory for you to then draw or paint on. Mm -hmm. It may be part of your, you know, the work, um, so you may do things at different stages. Has anybody used lamination techniques before in their work? No? Yeah. 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 European papers. Do you all work with Japanese papers or European mainly? Well, when you say European papers, you 
manufactured in particular ways that are very different from Japanese paper. Yes, and yes. And with different basic materials. Yeah, I mean, Japanese paper tends to be made from Kozo, Mitsumata, or Gampi fibres, whereas European papers, either is their high quality rag that has been retted down with cotton and linen, or you can have cotton based papers, which a lot of these cylinder, this is a cotton based. So it's from the seed heads of the cotton, which is left after chinning. Um, so it's not used in textile, so they use it in paper. Shorter fibres than rag, but still good quality. But a lot of the papers, like Reeves Arch, you know, Watman Papers, Fabriano, um, Dutch, some of the, a lot of the Dutch papers, they are made on a cylinder with good quality furnish, usually cotton, sometimes wood added, but uh, cotton. They're quite soft. And you'll find a lot of these cylinder made papers, they're internally sized as opposed to surface sized, like gelatin. Um, Usually gelatin, is that? No, no, the good papers, the handmade papers will be gelatin, but um, that's tub sizing and it's not done on a commercial level usually. Um, they usually use now synthetic, like Agropel. What does tub sizing mean? Basically? Tub sizing means the sheet of paper is already made yeah. and then it goes through another process where you're almost dipping the, in a hot gelatin solution and then it's cured and pressed. It is a, it's quite a complicated um, you know, set of you know, treatments but um, that's traditional handmade paper and good handmade papers will be still probably um, sized with gelatin with alum added as well, a little bit of alum. Because alum makes a much greater affinity with gelatin, yeah, it will sit on paper, it will absorb into paper, but it doesn't bond with paper. You need um, aluminium su um, sulfate, which is an acidic compound, which attaches itself to the cellulose molecule and then attaches itself one side to the gelatin. So it actually acts as a, like a bridging complex and that makes the paper much more robust, so you can work the paper a lot more. Um, it helps, you know, the, the working characteristic, hardens the gelatin, basically. <clears throat> and then uh, we can start applying the adhesive. So we have two absolutely perfectly flat pieces of paper with the, the rough side uppermost. So what I will do now is apply the adhesive to this sheet and using the Melanex, obviously take this off, transfer it and register it from corner to corner. Now it's easy to do this, or relatively easy to do this, when you've got sheets of paper this size. If you've got something the size of this table, then it's better to put registration marks either locating on the table, you can just use pencil if you want, or little pieces of paper. So you can tip in in the corner and there, as you would with registering a print. And then you can manoeuvre that second sheet into place um, a lot easier. Or you can be slightly more generous and cut the paper much larger. So if you do miss a line, uh, then you can trim it off. Um, but normally, you avoid that if you can because it's wasteful. So um, take my next off. So we've got. Um, 
Japanese wheat starch, and you can see the, the consistency is quite, quite thick. Um, if we're using Japanese paper to join, we would dilute this by half again. But because this is um, you know, quite a thick and absorbent paper, um, you'll need additional thickness of, of adhesive. That's just blotter. <coughs> so we're using the, the paste brush, so lather it up quite well. They will hold quite a lot. And then just take the excess off along the side. Now, um, this is sticking pretty well to the, the melonex. It's not moving at all, but some papers will shift. So it's, it's a good idea to hold the corner when you first apply the adhesive um, because then it will um, keep in place. Just tamp it down and then apply the adhesive if you can and rotate it and push the adhesive through. Load it up again. It's always best to be a, as generous as possible. and squeeze the excess out. Um, the Japanese use different um, ways of pasting up. Um, in Kyoto, they tend to... This is a technique they use in Tokyo, and I find it a lot easier, really, to work with. And these brushes are new, so they lose the hairs a bit. What sort of hairs are they? This is horse hair. Horse hair. Yeah, and the cedar. They're all handmade. <clears throat> and, as, and, and there's gut as well. And as one expands, the other contracts, and vice versa when it dries. This one's horse. The shigoki, the other brush I have. That's also basically horse, but you get a lot of it uh, with sheep hairs, the, the white ones are sheep. So just give it a, an extra because it's very absorbent, this, this paper. It doesn't matter which way um, you brush it at all. Well, I tend to put it like that and then take the excess off. If you've got some really sticky paste and you use the brush a bit like that, you know, you can push it and then take it across. So you not so much pressure, but you're just taking the excess off. to avoid ridges and if you again if you're working with diaphanous paper you will see those ridges if you're not careful. Just clean up the excess. And you can use okay so Tip it on the corner and keep this up and then you can manoeuvre it a bit into to place. You've got a bit of slip with the adhesive as well. Already you can see the paper has expanded slightly differently. to have my glasses on. So I would actually um, advise you to, to measure the different stages of the, of the paper when it's dry. This is completely and utterly expanded differently. Is that because it's got a different kind of water in it? No, no, it's um, because it's the grain direction is opposing. 
You see how that's expanded differently. You can look fairly. If you stand up, see here, and and how much that is growing. And that's with minimal amount of moisture. And you can feel that it's still not too damp. So when you ex um, if you expand it even more by immersing it, you might see a much different approach. Okay. <clears throat> so just make sure. So that's expanded differently because of the amount of moisture at the top or the amount of No, because it's the grain the direction. direction. Just the, yes. only the grain direction. Yes. Yeah. Because I've, I've tried to keep, I mean, obviously there'll be very slightly different moisture content, but you now this is, um, yeah, it's the grain direction and how, you can see how that's grown just with a, a small amount of moisture. I mean, obviously this paper is um, a cylinder-made paper. If you have a, working with handmade, then you're going to have a much more even expansion and contraction around uh, the sides. Now these sort of things have a fundamental, you know, um, difference when we're working with fine art objects. I mean, this kind of detailing is might be too excessive for your working, but I, I, I think it will get you to understand the paper and its behaviour much, much more when you are just looking at these. Okay. Right. Um, so this one um, will be um, placed under a traditional press. So we'll have um, Bondina. I'll set that up. Bondina, a non woven polyester. You can use, you know, violin to achieve support, you know, fabrics mm -hmm. and clothes. A similar thing. Um, <clears throat> it's important when you're pressing anything, of course, to have. Um, a material that is, is going to um, be suitable for the object. Because if you want to impart a more a rough, slightly rougher texture, you would use a slightly rougher material in contact. Because e even though this is only slightly damp, it will take on the texture of its interleaving layer, particularly if you put a board and heavy weights on. So if you wanted it smoother, you could, you could even use Melanex for a time. Um, the evaporation rate is much slower, so you might get mold growth if you leave it too long. But you could impart a much glossier, uh, smoother surface by pressing it between something smooth like this. But this is quite a good match if you wanted to retain the qualities of this particular paper. This is quite a good match against this. So, you would take this off. So you have blotting paper on, on the underside, two or three sheets. Pondina. Then you can still use this because it might still be quite delicate to place on the press. Move that through. That's quite amazing, isn't it? How that's expanded. Move this. And then the second sheet on top. Make sure there's no creases in, because creases will impart indentations into your work. Which you might not want. So, if you're using that, like the surf, sometimes it's used to back things like our miniatures and to support yeah. our drawing. Yes. Would you still spray? Because that might damage the original drawing. 
we wouldn't um, we would spray the um, obviously the laminate and, and obviously to yeah, construct yeah. the laminate but attaching an Indian miniature to we would use slight moisture but you'd have to be very careful we, we would humidify something over a, a longer period so it wouldn't be sodden so it would be relaxing down the fibers and uh, but not interfering with with the ink so we'd be very very careful with that and, and if you're thinking of producing a drawing and using that method say if you had a very fine Japanese paper and you were laminating it hmm. would you advise to better to laminate it first Ideally, ideally, but it, sometimes you know you, you'll want to add things, perhaps, or or if you're working with a drawing quite organically, it might um, become you know um, compromised and, and thinner in an area where you might think, oh right, I've got to to put it on a backing or a laminate. I think um, it depends on the. I mean, just pick up on that point because certainly the work. I did when I was in Japan, mm -hmm. working, which was a studio making copies of Indian, Chinese, <coughs> Japanese paintings from sort of from the last 10th century. So using some of those like really old techniques, mm -hmm. um, but because the pigments were being either using ink or pigments bound with with signs mm -hmm. that wouldn't shift so easily with with water, that very often the painting would be made and then it's in the scroll, scroll mounting back to after the painting was completed. But it's, so it's really down to the adhesive, adhesive. <laughs> yeah. it's down to the adhesive and then, and then how, much, how much moisture is put onto the papers. And um, how you so work it as well. And how you work yeah, it. So when we, if we'd finished a painting, <clears throat> we would be then very, very, like Jane said, very careful and very delicate with the amount of, of water and pressure mm. to, to get one paper laminated or backed on, basically backing the paintings yeah. as we would do. Yeah. But I think that would be something also that we could follow up, certainly that you know I could I could do alongside yeah. training, yeah. so something mm -hmm. that we did in Kyoto, um, yeah, and it might be slightly different to what, what, you, what you're doing here in, in conservation. Yeah, I mean... Um, so we could this is just one well. te technique. This is the, the basic. I mean, there's so many I different think this permeations. Is great. I think, this, mm -hmm. I think yeah. there's so many different things we can begin to think about from this. Yeah. Okay, so that's then ready to go in the press, and you would rotate it and change the blotter. By rotating it, changing the blotter, they, the moisture dissipates, um, as it does with um, any sheet of paper, from the edges, I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but it actually dissipates from the edges and the toppermost surface. But you will find the underside, particularly in the central section, holding onto moisture a lot longer. So if you leave it just in situ without changing the blotter, without rotating, that could, um, well, in extreme cases, form mold if it's very thick laminate and, and in there for a long, long time but it will also affect the overall dis distribution and, and the, the fibres. Because what, what happens with moisture, the water goes into the amorphous and the um, crystalline areas and they swell. They usually swell widthways more than lengthways, but they'll do both. Okay? And that's how paper becomes larger. Um, but what happens... Um, the water, and particularly if you're immersing something, the hydrogen bonds which stick the fibres together, they get broken by the, the water and the fibres start rearranging themselves. So that's why paper is very weak when it's wet, because the hydrogen bonds are temporarily broken and they only, as the paper dries, reform in a different configuration. That's why your paper never looks the same after you've wetted it down. There's all, always subtle changes to the overall quality of the paper. And that's by this rearrangement. And they can be quite dramatic, you know, this rearrangement. So obviously paper is wet and it looks darker when it's completely wet as well. And it loses 
that darkness. It's what what's happening. It's not dark. It looks more transparent because the light is traveling through it. Is Japanese paper stronger when it's wet than because of the longer fibers? Yes, so? it is. It is. But it can be extremely, you know, especially if you're using gampy papers, which are absolute nightmare. You work with them. And they are um, very difficult to work with, very difficult. European papers in, in many ways are easier in regards to strength, but um, because um, of the, the density and the compaction of the, of the fibres. Okay, so that's, that's number one. You know, pressing just as, as you would um, anything really, but it's important to rotate and change the blotter. So you diffusing and, and increasing the rate of moisture from that centre moving outwards. Okay. How often would you change them? Well, when we first put it in, we'd probably change it a couple of times in that day, and then you could leave it for a couple of days and then go back to it. The longer it's in, it's, it's a good tip, the longer it's in the press, as indeed if it was attached to a carry barry board, the better it will be in regards to stability when you remove it or take it out of the press. Because what happens, it reach, reaches equilibrium, the moisture content, with the atmosphere and within the sheet of paper. There's nothing worse, and, and I've seen this with conservators um, that have rushed through a job, of, often because you get pressures of exhibition work, and they haven't pressed things. It looks dry, it feels dry. Put it in a frame and it's distorted, it, um, or hanging free, and it looks a mess. So in order to control that, long pressing um, is a good idea, and also keeping it on the carry barry board for as long as possible. Not always possible, but if you can, be mindful of that. In Japan, they keep the uh, scrolls on, on different stages for up to six months. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's not uh, possible for every occasion. But the longer you leave it, the more stable it will be, the less likely it's to distort when it's in a different environment. 